Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, when, when these debates uh, started four years ago, our first resolution was we must tolerate a nuclear Iran. Uh, well, this could well be the year that uh, Iran gets the bomb, and our government's action suggests that it is voting for the motion. Israel, on the other hand, might quite rationally decide it cannot tolerate a nuclear Iran and take military action to prevent it. This is perhaps the most dramatic and consequential way U.S. and Israeli policy may diverge. But there are many others. Israel's priority is its own security. Full stop. The U.S. is committed to Israeli security, but it has many conflicting priorities. Keeping control of Middle East oil out of the hands of jihadi extremists, for one encouraging the recycling of petrodollars into our vulnerable economy, strengthening ties with moderate Arab regimes, avoiding nuclear proliferation in the region. U.S. objectives might well be advanced by Israeli-Palestinian or Israeli-Syrian accords on terms Israel doesn't like very much at all. On the other hand, the special relationship has deep and profound roots. Some is value-driven, reverence for the Holy Land by American Jews and Christians alike, respect for Israel's democratic institutions. But some is highly strategic. Israel is our closest friend and ally in the Middle East. It has by far the greatest military capability in the region and is a major source of intelligence. And getting back to a nuclear Iran, Israel might well be our best shield. Israel did the U.S. and the region a favor, I would argue, by bombing the Syrian reactor. Maybe it will do the dirty work again, so we don't have to tolerate a nuclear Iran. Against this complex backdrop, can we say that by holding hands with, with Israel, America is shooting itself in the foot? Should America step back from its special relationship? Tonight's debate should provide some light on this vital issue and it will surely provide lots of heat. So it's my pleasure at this point to turn the proceedings over to uh, our moderator, John Donvan, and the, the stellar group of panelists who are going to debate this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd, I'd just like to invite one more round of applause for the gentleman who makes all of these debates possible, Robert Rosenkranz. Welcome, everyone, to another debate from Intelligence Squared U.S. I'm John Donvan of ABC News, and once again, it's my honor to serve as moderator. As the four debaters you see sharing the stage with me here at the Skirball Center for the Performing Arts at New York University, four debaters, two at each table, are debating this motion, the U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel. And I want to point out this is a debate. It's not a panel discussion. It is not a seminar. This is a debate. It's a contest with winners and losers. And you and our audience have the special role of choosing our winners. You are the judges in this debate. And by the time the evening has ended, you will have voted twice, once before and once after the debate, on whether you agree or disagree with the motion, especially after what you've heard. And the team that has changed the most minds at the end of the debate will be declared our winner. So let's go on to our first round of voting. Once again, the keypads to your seats are your means to do that. If you agree with our motion, the U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel, you're to push number one. If you disagree, a no is number two. If at this point you're undecided, that's number three. You can ignore the other numbers. And if you make a mistake, uh, just correct it, and the system will record your last entered number. So we'll have the results of that vote uh, quite shortly. We go in three rounds. We have opening statements of approximately seven minutes each. Then we go on to a middle section where the debaters talk directly to one another, uh, prompted also by questions from myself and from you in the audience. And then at the end of the evening, each team has two minutes of closing remarks. On to round one, then. Let the debate begin. Our first debater for the motion, the U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel is Roger Cohen, who will make his way to his lectern. Roger is a uh, uh, former foreign editor of the New York Times, a journalist who has traveled the world. 
who has uh, himself the interesting story. Uh, you, you are Cohen because when your dad left South Africa and moved to the UK, he was advised that it would be a good idea to change his name from Cohen. And his answer was? His answer was, he suggested maybe uh, Einstein, and uh, he stuck with Cohen. And it worked. That's why we tonight have Roger Cohen arguing for the motion the U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In life, when we fail, we call it stupidity to burrow deeper into failure. Measured by any standard, American policy toward Israel has failed over the past couple of decades. We are no closer to any kind of peace. Israelis and Palestinians today stand further apart than ever. They are estranged, they are mistrustful, they're antagonistic, they can scarcely even imagine peace. We will therefore submit to you tonight that rather than burrowing deeper into failure and so jeopardizing American interests, the United States should reconsider its ties with Israel. It should step back from its special relationship in favor of a normal relationship. Now, normal relations between allies and the United States and Israel must remain firm allies are often marked by differences with France, with Japan, with Germany, with Turkey, important allies all. America has regular and often open disagreements. What makes America's relationship with Israel special is its uncritical nature, even when U.S. interests are being hurt. What also makes the relationship special is the incredible largesse that the United States shows towards Israel. Over the past decade, $28.9 billion in economic aid, and on top of that, another $30 billion in military aid. That's almost $60 billion. That's 10 times the GNP of Haiti that is being gifted to a small country. Now, I ask you, to what end is this money being used? Ladies and gentlemen, we would submit that to ends often inimical to the American interest. Take the, emer take the ongoing Israeli settlement program in the West Bank. At a cost of about $100 billion, this enterprise has grown the number of settlers in the West Bank from about 140,000 in 1996 to about 300,000 today. If you add the roughly 150,000 Israelis in East Jerusalem, you get to a number of 450,000 Israelis beyond the 1997 border. That's not all. Money has poured into a repressive apparatus involving settler-only highways, reserved military areas, a separation or security barrier, the Israelis call it separation wall, hated separation wall, the Palestinians call it, a barrier that burrows into the West Bank and annexes 10% of the land. What's the result of this? Well, the result is an isolated, fragmented, atomized, fractured, humiliated Palestinian presence that simply makes a nonsense, a farce, of the notion of two states for two peoples. What I observed there on my visits to the West Bank amounts to a kind of primer in colonialism. Imagine Israelis in their fast cars blackberrying away, booming down these superhighways, while Palestinians on their donkey carts make their way on dirt tracks, if they can get there, to their orchards. Uh, this is a primer in colonialism, much more than it resembles a nascent Palestinian state. Yet two states for two peoples is the declared U.S. objective. In effect, the United States is bankrolling the very Israeli policies that are dashing its own aims and the hopes of Oslo by making two states almost unimaginable. Does this make sense? Is that clever? I don't think so. And if you don't think so, ladies and gentlemen, you should vote for the proposition tonight. Now, the United States has raised its voice occasionally. Jim Baker, for, for example, as Secretary of State in 89, said, forswear annexation, stop settlement activity. Now fast forward two decades to Barack Obama in Cairo, two decades and several hundred thousand settlers. He said, the United States does not accept the legitimacy of the continued Israeli settlements. And what did Prime Minister Netanyahu do two weeks ago? Planted saplings in various settlements and they are part, and said they are part of Israel for all eternity.
Now, in a normal relationship, in a normal relationship, there would be consequences to such defiance. In a special relationship, the one that exists, there are no such consequences. Now, America's perceived compl complicity in Israeli in violence carries a heavy price. Jihadi terrorism aimed at the United States is not pr primarily motivated, perhaps, by the Palestinian issue, but it is a major factor. It is a potent terrorist recruitment tool. The United States should stand by its allies, and Israel is an ally. But if America is to pay the blood and the treasure and the lost peace of mind that comes with supporting Israel, it should be ready at least to speak openly and critically of Israeli mistakes when needed. Taboos, ladies and gentlemen, are unhealthy. A climate that affixes charges of anti-Semitism to anyone critical of Israel and self-hating Jew to any Jew who is critical of Israel is unhelpful. For if there are not two states, there will be one state, and sooner or later the number of Palestinians in it will outnumber the number of Jews. And what then will remain of the Zionist dream? Ladies and gentlemen, there's also a moral issue here. I am a Jew. I know that Israel at its foundation in its Declaration of Independence said it would, quote, ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, and sex. We Jews know in our bones what persecution is. Alas, and this is hard to say, Israel has, in my view, lost touch with these fundamental values. By uncritically supporting Israeli policies in the West Bank and Gaza, America is undermining its own values, which at the very least stand for the absence of second-class citizenship and equality of opportunity. Yes, I know Israel's a vibrant democracy isolated in the Middle East, and its values are closer to ours than those of closed Arab societies. But that does not mean that we should endorse Israel's systematic dismemberment of the two-state option. And if President Obama is serious about reaching out to the Muslim world, America must appear much more as an honest broker and less as Israel's spokesman. And that requires a serious rebalancing. You will, I suspect, hear that Israel is a lonely David facing an Arab Goliath. You will hear that it needs blanket American support to be secure. This is simply not true. Nuclear-armed Israel is powerful. The United States can step back while ensuring Israel's security. And so I urge you to vote for the motion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Thomas. Our motion is the U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel and arguing first against the motion, Stuart Eisenstadt, who has been a former ambassador to the uh, European Union, but his career in government service is astounding when you go through his, uh, his resume. He has had undersecretary positions in commerce, in treasury, in the State Department. You didn't get agriculture? Not a farmer. Ladies and gentlemen, Stuart Eisenstadt. Thank you, John. I couldn't disagree more with Roger Cohen and strongly oppose the notion that the United States should somehow stand back from its special relationship with Israel. And I do so for the following reasons. First, if the United States would do so, it would betray the very principles upon which U.S. foreign policy is based. Unlike China or Russia or some of our European allies, our foreign policy since our founding fathers has never been devoid of morality. Indeed, morality is a central feature of our policy. As the first country to recognize Israel in 1947 after the Holocaust as a refuge for Jews, we would be betraying those principles were we to step back from the special relationship we've developed over 62 years. Second, it would mean abandoning the only democratic, loyal, reliable ally in the region, which shares American values of democracy, rights for women, judicial independence, freedom of speech, and forming a 21st century culture. It's the only state in the region which has a vibrant non-governmental sector, so that on policies that Roger mentioned, there are groups like Peace Now, Salam and others who are vibrantly 
and publicly opposing those policies, the only country in the region which permits that kind of debate and criticism of the government. In addition, it's not just American values, it is American interests. Israel shares American interests in combating terrorism, in creating pro-Western, moderate Arab states in the region, in stopping nuclear proliferation, and in having peace with all of its neighbors. In addition, if we were to withdraw that special relationship, it would be a sign of American inconstancy and weakness. What message would it send to other allies? Would they think they were going to be next on the chopping block? And indeed, to do so would only lead to more demands from those in the region. America has to stand behind its allies because if it doesn't, it will not have many left anywhere. In addition, the whole notion of this motion misunderstands the major issues facing the United States and the region, and I have spent an enormous amount of time and energy in that region in multiple capacities. Issues that we have with Iraq and Afghanistan, Pakistan and Iran, terrorist groups like al-Qaeda are unrelated to our special relationship with Israel. Indeed, what is going on fundamentally in these states is a contest internally within the Arab world between modernizing states and radical Islamic states who want to create an Islamic caliphate for the whole region, unrelated to Israel, unrelated to Israel. It's also a specious argument that somehow there's a zero-sum game, that the kind of outreach that President Obama properly is providing to the Muslim world is somehow inconsistent with a special relationship with Israel. And let me tell you from personal knowledge, there is no such zero-sum game. We can and do have both. We have a very close relationship, and I spent a lot of time in countries like Egypt and in Jordan and in the territories and in the Gulf helping build that relationship. And indeed, let me point out that it is because of the special relationship with Israel that the Arab states know that the way in which Israel will make concessions is when it has a dependable American ally so that it can make those territorial concessions. And I've seen it happen at Camp David under President Carter. All of Sinai given back. I've seen it happen with Jordan and the peace agreement with Jordan. Roger says there's been no peace. I mean, I don't know where you've been. How about the Egyptian peace, which has lasted now for over 30 years, and the Jordanian peace? And those concessions continued. For example, Prime Minister Barack in the Clinton administration, in which I served at the second Camp David, offered 95% of the land, including East Jerusalem, to Yasser Arafat. And what was the response? No, that's where the Second Intifada occurred. What was the response when Israel unilaterally withdrew from Gaza? What was the response? Rockets from Gaza. Dismantling the settlements, dismantling 3,000 people. And that was a response. So it is a specious argument that we can only have good relations with the Muslim world if we abandon Israel. Indeed, they know we need to have that relationship to convince Israel to make those concessions. In addition, where else would one have a special relationship? And with whom else? The Saudis, the Saudis who export Wahhabism as well as expensive oil, from whom 17 of the 19 9-11 terrorists came? Would it be Egypt, where I've spent a great deal of time? I think we need stronger relations with Israel. It's with Egypt, it's a one-party state, 28 years the same president. The opposition candidate was arrested when he ran against Mr. Uh, uh, Mubarak. Afghanistan, Pakistan, Lebanon, where is the special relationship? And let me close with this thought. When you say, where, why don't we have peace with the Palestinians? If there were a Martin Luther King, if there were a Mahatma Gandhi leading the Palestinian movement, they would have had statehood long, long, long ago. It is because there is no reliable Palestinian partner 
It is because of the Hamas Fatah problem. It is because when the Israeli public sees a withdrawal from Lebanon or a withdrawal on their own from Gaza, instead of reconciliation, they get rockets in response. That's why we don't have peace, not because uh, Israel doesn't want peace. And last, there are certain things with which we disagree with Israel, as we do with all allies, settlement policy and so forth. I didn't notice, for example, that Germany or the UK or France is providing the kind of troops we want in Afghanistan. You can have a special relationship with allies and not always agree. Therefore, I strongly urge you to vote against this pernicious motion which would undercut the very basis of foreign policy in the United States, the only bipartisan Stuart, foreign sorry, policy sorry. which we have in this country. All right. Here's where we are. We are halfway through the opening round of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan of ABC News, serving as moderator. We have two teams of two fighting it out over this motion. The U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel. You've heard the first two debaters. Now we move on to the third. I'd like to introduce Rashid Khalidi, who is a professor at Columbia University, a former advisor to the Palestinian delegation for the Arab-Israeli peace negotiations. He was in Beirut during the Israeli bombing, bombing in 1982. Uh, comes from New York born, comes from a uh, storied Jerusalem family who's bequeathed to the city of Jerusalem one of the world's leading libraries of Islamic literature, started by your grandfather, I believe. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Rashid Khalidi. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for braving the impending snowstorm. Um, you've heard from our opponents, uh, or one of our opponents, uh, 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 a pattern that we've heard a great deal of. And if you listen to the advocates of the special relationship with Israel, you would think that all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's not. You heard from my colleague, Roger, exactly how bad the situation is. I strongly recommend the next time any of you have a chance to go to the Holy Land that you take a little time away from your trip to Israel and spend some time in the West Bank. Spend three or four days, and you will see precisely how bad it is. Um, now, I would be the last person as a Middle East historian to suggest that all the problems of the Middle East are caused by the U.S. special relationship with Israel. They're not. Uh, there are problems with Arab governments. There are problems among the Palestinians. There are problems inside Israel, but some problems are caused by this special relationship. Let me just list a couple of them. One of them is that there is, as a result, in large measure, of our special relationship with Israel, an almost total deafness to public opinion in Palestine and in the Arab world. We hear the same kind of mantra about there's no democracy, there's no public sector. There, is, there are all kinds of things going on in public opinion in the Arab world. And one of the things that's going on is a deep dis distrust and unease with U.S. policy over this issue in particular. A second thing that has to be said is that there is a suspicion in public opinion in particular all over the Arab world of the fact that the United States in the Middle East, because of this special relationship, is not and cannot be an honest broker. Uh, everybody knows that the United States engages in prior coordination with Israel as a result of an agreement made by Secretary Kissinger back in the 70s before anything starts between Arabs and Israelis. Everybody knows, in other words, that there's a big, fat U.S. thumb on the scales when the United States acts as a mediator. I recall in the negotiations in Washington, we were at an impasse with the Israeli side, and uh, we were told, after much reluctance on the part of the State Department, that the United States would come with a bridging proposal. We were very pleased. They came with a bridging proposal that was worse than the position that the Israelis had offered us. This is what the special relationship gives you. It gives you a country that cannot act as an honest broker. And let me say something about United States reliability. Let me say something about what the United States looks like after 20 years when American presidents, since President Carter, have said not just that they were going to make peace with Egypt, which they did, but that they were going to make peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis. We have systematically failed in this effort over the past 20 years. The situation is, uh, 30 years in fact, the situation is infinitely worse today than when uh, Ambassador Rabinovich and I went to Madrid in October of 1991. It's worse for the Palestinians, it's worse for the position of the United States in the Arab world, if you care not what autocratic governments think, but what the people think about us. And this brings me to the main reason you should vote for this proposition. You, could, you should vote for this proposition in our opinion because 
the United States should be true to its principles. It should be fair, it should be equitable, it should be just. We give, as Roger said, $60 billion over the past 10 years to Israel. Uh, we are, in effect, engaged in supporting an occupation that has been going on for 42 years and counting. We are, in effect, underwriting settlements. And we're not just doing that with U.S. money that's fun U.S. tax dollars out of our pockets that's fungible. We are, we're doing that with tax-deductible contributions to settlements, to projects in the occupied West Bank, and essentially to doing things that are uh, uh, directly opposed uh, to United States policy and to the interests of the United States, not to speak of the interests of peace in the Middle East. Uh, we hear a great deal about security whenever Israel is talked about. We have to be concerned with Israel's security. Fine. We have to be concerned with the security of everybody in this region if we are going to be an honest broker, if some people are not of a higher uh, importance to us than other people. What about the security of Palestinians? In the, in the recent war in Gaza, it wasn't really a war. It was a one-sided uh, uh, affair. There were 1,400 people killed on one side and 14 on the other side. If we're concerned with human security, we should be concerned with numbers like this. We should be concerned with the fact that everybody knows that we are engaged not just in funding, financing, supporting diplomatically, but also in selling weapons uh, that are engaged in doing these kinds of things. Now, what can the United States do? In my view, it can do many things. It's not enough to say, oh, it's a shame the Palestinians are divided. The Palestinians are divided. They have deep, deep internal divisions. The United States has been working systematically to deepen those divisions. The United States should be helping to unite the Palestinians around a consensus whereby they can come forward and negotiate rather than trying to keep them divided as we've been trying to do. If our objective is not to weaken them, which is an Israeli objective, if our objective is peace, then there has to be not just an Israeli consensus for peace, there has to be a Palestinian consensus for peace. We have done everything possible to prevent this. This is one thing that we can and should do. What else can we do? I would argue that our policy should be linked not solely to what the stronger party, by far the stronger party, in this relationship wants. That is no way to make peace. Again and again, what the United States has, in effect, done is to help gang up on the Palestinians. The United States has to pull away from the special relationship with Israel if it is to play any kind of effective role in making peace. Now, uh, this is particularly true because the hardest issues between the Palestinians and the Israelis, much harder than anything that had to be dealt with between uh, Israel and Jordan or Israel and, and Egypt, have to do with issues that resonate all over the Arab world things like refugees, things like Jerusalem. These are not easy issues. If we stand with the stronger, as we have done consistently on these and other issues, if we stand with Israel and ignore the fact that these are not just things on which there's a claim on both sides, but most importantly, these are things that will negatively affect U.S. interests if we take a one-sided position, we are harming U.S. interests throughout the region. If you vote against this proposition, I would argue you are voting for the status quo. You are voting for more of the same. You are voting for a peace process that has delivered a lot of process and no peace. And that is what we have gotten from every administration up to this point. We have peace with Egypt. We have peace with, Israel, we have peace with, uh, with Jordan. Peace with the Palestinians is much farther away. Uh, I would suggest that voting for this status quo is to say, in effect, we're going to bury our heads in the sand. We're going to allow a two-state solution to disappear. I personally don't think it has very many chances anymore. But if this is something that is important, if we do not want the future for Israel that uh, 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 many Israelis see where Israel continues to rule over the Palestinians, we should vote in favor of this proposition. Thank you very much. Our motion is the U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel and our last debater arguing against this motion. Itamar Rabinovich is a former uh, Israeli ambassador to the United States. He was on the White House lawn when Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat shook hands. He has seen what he felt uh, on several occasions, Peace Come Near. His book, On the Brink, The Brink of Peace, was about his involvement in negotiations with the Syrians. We went to the brink and then pulled back. Ladies and gentlemen, Itamar Rabinovich. Thank you. I, I urge you strongly to vote against, uh, against the motion. Uh, I think that the motion uh, indicates 
uh, a desire to destroy the United States' most important, <clears throat> most successful relationship in a very important part of the world. What does special relationship mean? It does not mean that the tail is walking the dog. It is a mutual relationship. I was an ambassador to Washington for nearly four years. I was a peace negotiator that worked very closely with the United States peace team. And I know how many disagreements we have had over the years with our American colleagues. How many times what we call pressure was brought to bear on Israeli decision makers. Even presidents who were considered very friendly. Bill Clinton was considered a great friend of Israel. He was a close friend of Yitzhak Rabin. He admired Rabin, but I've seen them argue fiercely. And I've seen Rabin yield to Clinton because he was the President of the United States, the senior partner in this special relationship. Now, what is special about the relationship? It's special, it's unique, because you have <clears throat> unusual loyalty on both sides. You have many relationships around the world, as was mentioned. Is your relationship with France so close? Doesn't France undermine U.S. interests and policies in parts of the world? Japan is a close ally. Look at the arguments you are having with Japan over stationing of U.S. troops in Japan. You will not have such an argument in, with Israel because there are no U.S. troops stationed in Israel. It's a very close military and strategic alliance <clears throat> defined, among other things, by the fact that Israel does not want American troops to be stationed in Israel. Israel wants to look after its own security with American help, with American weapons and equipment, but on its own. And not having to station troops in Israel or in that part of the Middle East because Israel is there is a huge advantage. Because look at the other side of the Middle East, an important part of the Middle East, the Persian Gulf, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, countries that are of enormous influence or importance for the United States. You have troops there. You have many American troops at a huge cost in Iraq. You have troops in Afghanistan. You have troops stationed in Saudi Arabia. And remember, what did the Al-Qaeda uh, terrorists say once they exploded into the World Trade Center? The first, the first reason they cited for, the US, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, for attacking the U.S. is that the United States has troops on sacred Muslim soil in the Arabian Peninsula. In Israel or in near Israel, you don't need to station U.S. troops. It's a very close alliance. It's an alliance based on mutuality on a full uh, loyalty on both sides, acceptance of, of course, the seniority of the United States in that relationship. And this relationship serves you in an area in which many, many American interests are focused. Now, the argument, the argument of the people who put this for, for a vote, the argument of our opponents in this debate, is that uh, support to Israel undermines uh, American position in Arab public opinion and uh, reinforces uh, Arab and Muslim tendency uh, uh, to terrorism against the United States. Wrong. What uh, uh, Arabs resent most, as I said, is American military presence, American support for uh, dictatorial regimes. Let me read a very perceptive uh, comment written uh, a while ago. Iraq has changed everything in Washington, a city obsessed with the president. It was easy to forget that as recently as a few years ago, the United States was not particularly disliked in the Middle East, and that Al-Qaeda was a tiny underground organization with almost no popular support. Very perceptive, Professor Khalidi, who wrote these, these lines. So we... <clears throat> So we, we are in agreement on, on a few things, but uh, we take different conclusions uh, uh, from them. So another complaint that I have against uh, our opponents in this, is this debate. First of all, too much was focused on the Palestinian issue. It's a very important issue. It's important first and foremost for us. I'm one of those Israelis who desperately believe and fight for having a two-state solution. I think it's dangerous for Israel to keep the status quo. Now, there are people in Israel who think otherwise, and politically we disagree. Uh, 
and the United States and the government of Israel do want to see a two-state solution. But the Palestinian problem is not the only one. Said there is peace with Egypt, there is peace uh, with Jordan, and normal relations with uh, quite a few Arab countries. And that has been achieved by the United States, precisely as my colleague Stu Eisenstadt said, because the United States is the power, that ha the uh, great power that has the ability, the influence to work with Israel. And Arab countries who want to see a change, Syria, if it wants the Golan back, knows that the road to the Golan leads to Washington, not through uh, Tehran. So actually, the closeness to Israel, the perception in the Arab world that the United States has that sway with Israel is uh, <clears throat> the, one of the most important uh, uh, assets that the United States has. And believe me, I spent hundreds of hours talking to the Syrians as the peace negotiator with Syria, and I know exactly full well they wanted to make peace with Israel because that was a pathway to Washington. They worked with Washington in order to make peace with Israel. Finally, much of what you heard from our opponents earlier this evening was actually in the frame of the Bush years. We are not in the Bush years anymore. For a year, there has been another administration in Washington. And actually, what we have seen was the President Obama who listened to such advice and began by taking some distance from Israel. He went to Cairo, he gave the, the speech to the Muslim world, he didn't go to, to Israel. What is the result? The result is the current impasse. It was a mistake to take even one step because the voices that he heard from the Arab world was you took one step, go all the way. That is the mistake. So the policy should be stay with the special relationship with Israel and together with Israel use it in order to make peace with the Middle East, including with the Palestinians. And, uh, and that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate where the motion being argued is the U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel. And we now have the results of our live audience vote. We asked you before the debate began where you stood on our motion. The U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel. Before the debate began, here's where it stood. 33% of you were for the motion, 42% against, and 25% were undecided. Now on to round two, and in round two, the debaters can address one another directly. I will ask some questions of them, uh, and we will come to you in the audience to ask questions. And I once again want to urge you, we very much like your participation, but we ask you to think in terms of a question, think in terms of something that you can say in 40 seconds, think in terms of something that has a question mark at the end, and that is also, that is also on topic. But where, where I want to begin this, uh, I want to go to the side that is arguing against the motion, which argued in part, particularly Stuart Eisenstadt, who served in so many administrations uh, and was involved in this region, argued that turning away from Israel at this point would be an immoral act because Israel has been such a, uh, a loyal ally for so long. And I want to put to that side, to either gentleman, uh, the question, so what would actually happen to Israel if the U.S. created more distance? Well, what would happen is that the United States would lose the levers and influence it has and it has used to encourage Israel to make the concessions that it has made. It's inconceivable, for example, that Israel would have given up all the Sinai at Camp David I with President Carter to Egypt if it didn't know that the United States was solidly and affirmatively in its corner. Uh, and the same is true with respect to other concessions that uh, Israel has made. These depend on a mutuality of interest. And what I'll mention, John, in my closing points is the very specific concrete benefits that that relationship with Israel provides to the United States. They're very concrete, from intelligence sharing to missile technology sharing to standing shoulder to shoulder to oppose Iranian nuclear threats. So the interests are not just values. They are profound U.S. national security interests. But again, the direct answer to your question is it would send a signal to Israel of inconstancy. Israel would be less likely to make concessions. But, would, but it would, would say the same to our other allies. What would it say? But would it be harmful for Israel is what I'm It asking. would be very harmful Why? to Israel because Israel would be completely alone. Where else does it have a very close relationship. To whom else would it turn? 
for support. I mean, in the 1967 war, at the maximum time of their danger, right, when the state was almost eliminated by all the Arab countries, their prime arms supplier was not the United States of America, it was France. And in the midst of the war, that arms shipments were totally cut off, 100% cut off. So Israel has nowhere else to turn as a major ally other than the United States. It would feel increasingly isolated. It would be much more intractable in terms of the peace process. And I think it would be a terrible thing both for Israel and for the United States. To the other side, is it an act of betrayal to put No, it's not an act of betrayal. Uh, with respect to, nobody is arguing for a divorce here. Nobody is arguing that Israel should cease being an ally of the United States. Uh, we are simply arguing that when President Obama says that he wants settlements to stop and settlements continue and Prime Minister Netanyahu declares that some settlements are Israel's for all eternity, that there should be consequences. And I believe that if the United States were firmer, if it made it clear to Israel that there are indeed consequences, then Israel would measure its actions much more carefully. And there would be more chance of getting a resumption of uh, Israeli-Palestinian talks, which are currently paralyzed. Israel, if it thinks it can act with complete impunity, is not going to be responsive to U.S. desires. Itamar right, Rabinovich, right, former U.S. Right, ambassador. Sure, if I may just quickly intervene. Stuart, let me, let me go to Itamar. He's looking yeah. to speak. Briefly, I'd like to say, of course, uh, it, it would not be good for Israel if the U.S. walked away from the special relationship. There would be both a substantive and a perception issue of weakening Israel. Israel would go to the right, maybe to, to the radical right. Further? But my, my point is, what is going to happen to the United States? Now, let me read one sentence from the most unlikely source. If you go to this week's New Yorker, Seymour Hersh, discussion with Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, says... Now, the problem is that the United States is weaker, and the uh, whole world, influential world is weak as well. You always need power to do politics. Now, nobody is doing politics. So what you need is a strong United States with good politics, not weaker United States. For the United States that walks away from Israel sends the signal of weakness, inconstancy, it's not going to be good for U.S. policy. Rashid Khalidi. I think... This is, like, this is like telling us, when you're in a deep hole, the thing to do is dip, dig deeper. I mean, we have enabled, we have enabled the worst instincts of Israeli politics. We have enabled and supported and financed the worst policies in terms of, leave aside American interests. We're all Americans. That should be the only thing that matters to us. Israeli interests. Why is occupation and settlement in the Israeli interest? Ambassador Rabinovich is an, oppos is an opponent of these things. Most right-thinking Israelis that most of us know are. But Israeli politics is moving in exactly the opposite direction. What we are doing is enabling these tendencies. And let me say one other thing about constancy. When we are doing something that everybody in the world thinks is dumb, the idea of staying the course does not make us look constant. It makes us look dumb. And, and, and our allies, we were, we, were asked, we were asked rhetorically by one of my opponents, if the United States moved away from the special relationship, what would happen with some of our allies? They would applaud. They see the United States as systematically weakening itself by this perverse special relationship. Stuart, they I see, what about so, that very point, that our allies would actually applaud uh, a readjustment to the well, US two, relationship? Well, two things. First of all, when Roger says he's not calling for a divorce, okay, Sometimes it's difficult for spouses and countries to tell the difference between a separation and a divorce. The implications can be the same. And second, <laughs> second, I was ambassador to the European Union. I've spent an enormous amount of time in Europe. I can tell you that it would send a chill down the spine of every ally we have in Europe and around the world if this relationship were abandoned because they would say, well, are we next on the chopping block? It would be a terrible sign of inconstancy. What the world wants is a strong, constant United States that stands behind its principles, that stands behind its values, and stands behind its allies. If, 
if I may, yeah, yeah, uh, Roger Cohen. with respect, I've also spent a lot of time in the European Union, not as an ambassador, and my perception of European publics and European governments is that many are bewildered by the extent and degree of U.S. support for Israel and would applaud some modification of that relationship. The, um, the side arguing for the motion said that made a rather cogent argument, quite logical, that the, the U.S. Uh, relationship with Israel raises the question of whether the United States can be an honest broker in the Middle East. What, take, take that on either side against the motion. We've both seen it from different perspectives, myself from the United States perspective and Itamar from the Israeli perspective. Every moderate Arab country knows that only the United States can talk to both sides. It is the only honest broker. And indeed, if it were to withdraw from that special relationship, it would lose the capacity to have the ear of the Israelis in the way it does now. It is an honest broker. That's why, even though there's a quartet with the UN and Russia and so forth and the EU, it's only the United States, the secretaries of state, the president, who are the active ingredients in the peace process. The Arab states know that. The Europeans know that. The Israelis know that, and so we are accepted as the honest broker. And again, I think that Itamar is right. You're retreading Bush. We've got a different president who's reached out to the Muslim world and who said in Cairo, yes, we want to have stronger relationships with the Muslim world. Yes, we want to have a two-state solution, but yes, we stand firmly behind the state of Israel as a Jewish state. That's being an honest broker, and that's what's accepted on all sides. Does the other side agree that President Obama is changing the game? Uh, I'd actually like to say Chris something about this honest broker thing. I don't think the United States is anything uh, in any way an honest broker. The United States is quite frequently the only broker because the United States hogs the stage. Uh, look at what the United States does to the quartet. It essentially tries to turn them into a bunch of poodles who will follow the American lead. It successfully does that quite frequently, even with the Euro European Union and with the Russians. Uh, and I think this is actually a problem. Uh, we have seen more constructive diplomacy in the Middle East from Qatar and Turkey, uh, incidentally an important democratic ally, a country with a public sphere, a major ally over decades going back to the launching of NATO. The only democracy in the Middle East is not Israel. Uh, and We've seen more constructive uh, diplomacy from those two countries than we've seen from the United States over the past several years as far as brokering uh, a peace uh, between uh, or trying to broker peace. Tr for example, arranging a, a settlement of the conflict in Lebanon. No, uh, uh, and I, w I would suggest that uh, it, is, it, is, it is in the United States' interest to bring others in. It's in the United States' interest to make this a multilateral settlement. James Baker, to his enormous credit, understood this. And, and that's one of, the, one of the most important achievements of Madrid. It was to bring other parties in. Now, the United States has this tendency to monopolize things. It is a tendency to be resisted. Do you see President Obama changing the game? I, th I think the President's right. problem at the moment is that he's gone a long way in words with the Cairo speech, uh, with the speech in Istanbul, with other gestures. But when it comes to actions, and people are looking at actions, I think the Palestinians tend to see more of the same. And, and that is the issue here. Can we be imaginative? Can we think outside of the box? Look, when the Oslo Accords came in the 1990s, the PLO Charter still existed. It existed until 1996 in its original form, calling for the annihilation of Israel. Now, did this stop the imaginative negotiators in the 1990s from moving that process forward. Oslo was 1993. This was done while the charter still existed. The Hamas charter calling to annihilation of Israel is vile. It is unacceptable. But can we think outside the box about these things? Can we look for new forms of engagement? Can we think and act in different ways that might advance peace? I think so far the, the verdict on the Obama administration and on what uh, Mr. Mitchell has been trying to achieve is no. And I think it is important that we look at the Middle East the way it is, not the way we would like it to be or imagine it might be, but what the reality of this increasingly sophisticated Middle East is today. What is Hamas, really? What is Hezbollah, really? Let's look at these things in a hard-headed way and let's think about and, and, and find some new ideas. And I think right now, the president's in a halfway house, and that's why we're seeing no movement. Oh. Mm -hmm.
I, I want to let Itamar Rabinovich uh, answer that question, but uh, I want to, after that, get to questions from the audience, so I'd like to, to uh, disperse our microphones and bring the lights up. Itamar, your response. Yeah. You know, uh, President Obama's uh, some distancing from, uh, from Israel. Uh, Abu Mazen, the, the president of the Palestinian Authority, is not joining the negotiations now because he says, President Obama, you put me up on a tree. You have to help me climb down. Because when President Obama seemed to, to be taking a pro-Palestinian, anti-Israeli position at, at the outset, his expectation was that the Muslim and Arab world would applaud. The real reaction was, give us more. We will not come to the negotiations. You have to deliver Israel. It was a very bad mistake. And uh, Roger, when you say, think out of the box about the Hamas charter, which is not an anti-Israeli, an anti-Semitic document, speaking about the protocols of Zion, I don't know how to think outside the box about that. I would rather be in the box. So Right, it's my, so, so was the charter of the PLO. It got changed. And how did it get changed? It got changed through negotiation. Can you respond to that, Itamar? Yes. You, ne you, can, you can negotiate with a secular nationalist movement like the, the Fatah. Uh, Hamas is a radical, religious, fundamentalist organization, and you cannot negotiate with people who have these strong religious convictions. Itamar, you can Israel, with Israel is negotiating thinking. with them. Israel is negotiating a prisoner release with, with Hamas right now. Israel negotiates with Hamas all the time. In fact, it suits Israel perfectly, perfectly to have Hamas and Fatah divide and to have nobody to talk to. You will have peace in this part of the world between Palestinians and Israelis when there's not just an Israeli consensus but a Palestinian consensus. There are enough people in Hamas who are interested in the resolution of this conflict that if, as Roger said, so, we could think outside the box, uh, so, we could get something. So when, uh, when, when, Eod Olmert, when Eod Olmert went out of his way and offered much more than Eud Barak and any other Israeli politician, put it on the table, why did Abu Mazen not take it? All right, let me go to questions from the I audience. could answer that. We're going we're gonna to leave a lot of things hanging because we will keep going. We'll come back to it. You can put that question to him. I want to move on to this. And if one of you wants to take that question back, you're welcome to. Right down in the seat of the seat of gentlemen. Please stand up, and uh, right down if you're answer. with the media, let us know. My name is Ziad Ramadan. I'm the uh, president of the Council on American Islamic Relations in New York. It was often said of Yasser Arafat that he never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Is it, have we come into the era where Israel is starting to make decisions in its uh, worst interest? That Chaz Freeman, who was a nominee for one of the top intelligence posts in the United States, criticized them and said that himself before he pulled his nomination due to criticism from Israel and uh, American uh, elected officials. Are we entering an era where Israel continuously makes decisions and, and that how, hurts how its you, future? And how would you relate that also to the issue of U.S. interests, which is our topic tonight? No, and, and I'm, you can. I just want to see you do no, it. No, absolutely. Um, we, as an American, I think that uh, I think back as a Palestinian myself, I'm jaded whenever they say, whether it's Jimmy Carter or Bill Clinton or Ronald Reagan or George Bush Sr. or Jr., it's, it's always said that we're going to work towards peace in the Middle East, and it always seems like an Israeli prime minister spits in the face of the U.S. president and says, it doesn't matter what you say. We're going to do whatever what we want to do, and we're still going to take your billions from you all the time. So as my tax dollars are going to build settlements where... Okay. where yeah, I do need a question. Okay. But what's your question? My, I, I apologize. I no, I want a question that's me. on our topic. Uh, oh. is, is, it, is it in the U.S. interest to support Israel financially while they continuously um, disagree with Thank what you. we want Just, them to do? Thank you. to this one. A couple of things. First, several people have mentioned, including uh, Roger, inaccurately, uh, that the United States continues to provide huge amounts of economic aid to Israel. I can tell you that the, during the first Omer government, they came to me when I was Under Secretary of State, and they said, we are now a highly developed country. We don't need and we don't want that economic assistance. And they came to us, and I negotiated the total cutoff of that aid. There's not a nickel in economic aid being given to Israel. The aid now is all economic. Security. 
Well, my my side, aid is respect, all given for security purposes, uh, not Rapoor economic Roger, purposes. Let me finish, I'll all bring security. Roger Cohen. Well, no, a congressional report just put the total at $28.9 billion over the past decade. So how you can state, Sue, that there is no economic aid going from the United States to Israel, uh, I don't know. Uh, in response to, to your question, sir, I, I, you know, critics of Israel uh, are often told that they are anti-Israeli. Uh, my response is no. Uh, I think I have the long-term interest of Israel. Uh, in my heart. And uh, to say uh, that it is in Israel's interest uh, to go on uh, building these settlements strikes me as the height of foolishness, because what will be the result of this? We are at the point, or we are very close to the point, where a two-state solution becomes impossible. At that point, we are talking about a single state between the river and the sea. Uh, that state uh, will very soon such a state will very soon have more uh, Palestinian Arabs in it than Jews. Uh, what then is going to happen to the Zionist dream? And I think uh, to point this out to Israel is in fact acting in Israel's self-interest. And the unfortunate thing about U.S. policy is it doesn't, w without stepping back, it doesn't act strongly enough to stop Israel making a two-state solution impossible. And I think that is the very core of the issue here. Gentlemen with the... Uh Eyeglasses and sweater. Question for uh, Messrs. Cohen and Khalidi. Could when you bring the mic a little bit closer? When Stuart Eisenstadt said earlier on in the debate that had the Palestinians had a Palestinian version of Gandhi or King, there would have been a two-state solution a long time ago. Is that a statement with which you agree or disagree? And if you disagree, why? And separately, what is the answer to the question that we lost as we transitioned into the Q&A? Why did Abu Banzan turn down the deal? Why don't Thank I you. answer that? Why don't I answer that uh, question first? Um, Abu Mazen does much of what he does because he's weak. He's weak because we've made him weak. He's weak for other reasons as well, but a primary reason is because Israel and the United States have systematically undermined him. What happened with the Goldstone Report? I don't want to go into the Goldstone Report. Abu Mazen was pressured, was blackmailed, was threatened by the Israelis, uh, to, uh, in effect, prevent the consideration by a United Nations human rights body of a report that was critical both of Hamas and especially of Israel. Uh, this is an example uh, of the kind of situation that Abu Mazen is in. Why is he in this situation? He's in this situation because he does not represent all the Palestinians. And he's in that situation because a Palestinian coalition government, which would have included Hamas, was something that was strongly opposed both by Israel and by the United States. Now, that would have been a government in which Hamas would have authorized Abu Mazen to go ahead and negotiate with Israel. That would have been a government that might conceivably have reached an agreement or might not have. But it certainly would have been better than the situation we're in. And let me just make one point about the special relationship. One of the things that the special relationship does is it imports Israeli considerations into U.S. law. I was told by an American official, one of the reasons we can't have a Palestinian coalition government, which might in fact be a better negotiating partner, is because it's against U.S. law. We would have to cut off our funding to any government that included Hamas, even a government that authorized negotiations for peace. That is an example of why we should uh, end this special relationship. Stuart Eisenstein. I want, to, I want to answer the question and connect an important thread and say something I haven't said publicly before, because there's a connection. I sat with Yasser Arafat in his office in Ramallah three weeks before Camp David II was supposed to start with President Clinton and Prime Minister Barack. He said to me, tell President Clinton not to invite me. I'm not ready to go and to negotiate. Likewise, the reason why Arafat wouldn't go or didn't want to go and why he turned down a remarkable concession from Barack, 95% of the territory, East Jerusalem is the capital, is the same reason that Abu Mazen wouldn't accept an even more generous offer from Olmert. And that is, they're afraid they'll be assassinated by Hamas. That's point blank the reason. And the radicals in the Palestinian movement, who I do not believe are in the majority, have a tremendous hammer hold over the moderates. Let's go to another question. You know, 
Uh, gentlemen, yes, uh, yellow tie. You can stand and mic, please. I'm sorry, I meant on the other side. Forgive me, I'll come back to you. I, I owe you a comeback. Hi, Mike. My question is very specifically about U.S. interest in U.S. security. Can you bring your mic up a little closer? Sorry. Um, very specifically about U.S. interest in U.S. security. We've talked a lot about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and how you, the special relationships affect the special relationships affect uh, the peace process. But very specifically, how would a change in this relationship affect U.S. security interests, specifically vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the jihadi elements who are working against the U.S.? How would that relationship either improve their view of the U.S. or be a detriment okay. to the U.S. So, so Stuart Eisenstein was talking about the impact on our allies. You're asking about at the impact on our relations with our foes. Which side would like to take that? Well, I think Roger if you Cohen. can advance uh, a Middle East peace, uh, clearly uh, you are going to withdraw, remove a very powerful uh, recruitment tool uh, for the jihadis. They, if you look at Osama bin Laden's speeches going back a very long way, if you look in the 9-11 report at what Khalid Sheikh Mohammed said, the, the mastermind of 9-11 about how uh, policy toward the Palestinians was really what drove him toward the thing. It wasn't his stay in the United States. It, what, it was what he observed of U.S. Israeli policy toward the Palestinians. So if you can appear more as an honest broker, if you can move this paralyzed process in some way, uh, then I think uh, you could advance U.S. security uh, in that respect. Look, have the Palestinians made mistakes? Have there been offers on the table that should perhaps have been uh, accepted? Yes, but we're not talking about the past. We're talking about trying to move forward here. That is what this debate is about uh, tonight. And I think to throw out uh, the ultimate offer when he was already uh, had great legal difficulties, was on his way out of office. Uh, it really wasn't uh, uh, credible uh, at that point. So I, I, I don't find that in any way persuasive. Itamar Rabinovich. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, two issues. One, uh, the terrorism. That, uh, support for Israel increases terrorism. Uh, you, you're all New Yorkers. You live in New York. Open the magazine last week. Very interesting story about a young man from Alabama, Omar Hamami who grew up in a small town in Alabama and is now fighting with Al-Qaeda in Somalia. Very interesting, long article in the New York Times magazine. The word Israel does not appear once. He became a terrorist not because of Israel, but because of other reasons. Secondly, I want to go back to the point raised by uh, Stu Eisenstadt before. Gandhi, <coughs> other, other leaders. Abu Mazen is not weak because the United States or Israel weakened him. He's weak because he's weak. Where you have <clears throat> people, people, who made, people who made peace. Gandhi was not made by the British. Mandela was not made by the Americans. And uh, King Hussein and uh, <clears throat> Anwar Sadat, who signed peace with Israel, were strong leaders. That's why they could take the countries to, to peace. So unfortunately, we have not had the kind of Palestinian leader who, become, who could, could become the Palestinian Mandela uh, who would bring about the uh, rapprochement, the reconciliation between let, Israelis and Palestinians. This comes from an Israeli who wants that. Let, let me say Let's something. Do. Let, me, let me say something. Let me say something about the this, this sainted Nelson Mandela, a man who I think we all greatly respect. He headed an armed movement. He was not a, an apostle of nonviolence. He led an armed movement that succeeded in forcing a political resolution of a conflict. Now, I personally am a believer in this conflict now that nonviolent means are the, the best means for the Palestinians. Uh, I don't think, however, that we should get too mystical about this. There are many uh, colonial, many oppressive, many occupation regimes that would never have disappeared but for armed, violent resistance. I, that is something that, that is something that, that is something that's very painful to say because in this country we have a constitution. And what Martin Luther King was calling for was that we live up to the highest principles of this country. I argue that in the Palestinian case, that would be appropriate, although for other reasons. Uh, but, in, but, but to say, 
in a situation of occupation and in a situation of, of oppression. This is not two equal parties. These are not two states. There is one country between the Mediterranean and the sea. It occupies the entirety of the territory. It's the only sovereign state. It has ruled every single Palestinian in that territory, some of them as citizens of the state of Israel, a minority, four million of them as helots with no rights for 43 years. Let's resistance to, uh, resistance audience, in that please. case is legitimate. Good evening. Is it the anti-Semitism of United Nations, which Israel and America always complains about, that there are 50 and odd resolutions requesting Israel to vacate the occupied land, Israel and America look the other way, but whereas when it comes to Iraq war, Bush presidency on one resolution went for an illegal war. This special uh, arrangement between Israel and America is really hurting, in my opinion, and my question to the, one of the panelists will be, why are these resolutions not implemented uh, which are asking Israel to vacate the occupied land. You're asking if the U.S. has a double standard on U.N. The U.S. has a double standard. Stu Israel has a, has a double standard. Thank you. Thank you. The United States uh, has vetoed. So Roger, I, I want yeah. to bring this to the insider first, and then I'll okay. come to you. Okay. Sure. Stuart Eisenstein. The U.N. Human Rights Commission has developed resolutions over the last decade and a half two-thirds of which are directed at Israel, not at Iran, not at Iraq, not at all the human rights violations that occur around the world. Two-thirds are directed to Israel. This is grossly disproportionate. Number two, with respect to general resolutions, let's go back to the first resolution of the United Nations, which was to create a two-state solution. And Ben-Gurion accepted a sliver of territory, sliver. and it was rejected by the Arabs. And that rejection has continued with the exception of Egypt and Jordan from 1947 to 2010. Roger Cohen. Uh, sir, well, the United States has vetoed uh, more than 40 resolutions critical of Israel over recent years. That's more, I believe, than all the vetoes put together of all the other members of the Security Council. This is indeed a special relationship. And the question we're asking tonight is, is that really in the benefit of the United States and of Israel? And I would submit not. If you look at the Goldstone Report, the UN report on the uh, war in Gaza, surely this report was imperfect. No doubt there were errors in it. I know Judge Goldstone. I met him years ago in The Hague. Believe me, he is a balanced and intelligent man. Did he make some mistakes? Yes, but the, the Israeli reaction was, no, this is just an expression of the world's bias. This is an outrage. This is absolutely unacceptable. And the U.S. gave it some protection in that stance, which I consider to have been uh, outrageous. Uh, there, there, there is no justification for the position. What has happened since? Israel has quietly censured uh, two generals. It has agreed to pay compensation uh, to the United Nations. Behind uh, the defiance, uh, it has been uh, making its own uh, admissions of the fact that there were problems in this. And I think it is the United States' special relationship with Israel which allows it to say before the world, no, we never make mistakes. This is all a plot against us. And I don't think this is helpful to Israel. And it is not good for the United States Tomorrow, to be in that Rubinovich. position. Uh, the United Nations, the Human Rights Commission, do you know who are the members of that commission? Who was the chairman of that commission? The country called Libya. <laughs> uh, who is a member? Who is a member of that commission? Zimbabwe with Mugabe. Uh, Roger, you are from originally, you know, South Africa. You know who Mugabe is. So, if the commission has, <clears throat> Lib as Libya and Zimbabwe and countries like that, it has no moral authority. And Goldstone drew, drew his mandate from a place without moral authority. Rashid Khalidi. Yeah. Um, as someone whose father worked for the United Nations, uh, I, I'm going to defend this institution. I think it ill, it ill 
it does not behoove those who uh, are, are friends of Israel to bash the United Nations. The birth certificate of Israel <laughs> is delivered by the United Nations in the form of the resolution that Ambassador Eisenstadt ma ma mentioned, the, the partition resolution of 1947. Now, that did not give uh, uh, the issue of a sliver of Palestine. It gave 33% of the population that owned 6% of the land, 55% of the country, some sliver. <laughs> let me say a couple of other things. I cannot let some of these things pass simply as a historian. We are told, we are told that the Arab countries have been rejecting everything since 2010. A majority of Arab countries came to the Madrid, Madrid Peace Conference. Ambassador Rabinovich and I saw them there. Now, what kind of rejection is it when they come to a peace conference? They all voted in favor of an Arab peace resolution in, in, in Beirut and, and one before that, way back in 2002. This is not rejectionism. We are told about remarkable concessions. Remember, when a country is in illegal occupation of territory and it agrees to give it back, there are various ways of talking about that. I would not use the word concession. <laughs> thirdly, thirdly... Rashid, I just want to ask you, how long is your list? Pardon me? How long is your list? I have... I have two more, but I'll go, I'll, I'll go for one. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we were told that in 1967, Israel was almost eliminated. If you go to the U.S. government documents and you go to the extraordinarily ample Israeli documentation, you will see that not one Israeli military intelligence or American military intelligence report or military uh, officer of, 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 of field rank and above thought that there was any chance of Israel being defeated, let alone eliminated, in the 1967 war. I know people here believe that was a that possibility. I know that many people in Israel feared it. But that was not a possibility at the time. Uh, I could go on and on. Okay. All right. I'm going to go back to a question here. I, I need to do a little bit of uh, announcing for radio. I just want to remind everybody, we are in the question and answer section of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan of ABC News. Uh, as, acting as moderator, we have four debaters, two teams of two, debating this motion. The U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel. Gentlemen, standing now with gray suit, red tie. Question. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Gurkoff. Um, among other things, uh, I'm affiliated with Tel Aviv University. Uh, a question I have is, or a, state, a small statement, but then a question is, all the attention tonight has been against Israel or, or for Israel or, or against the United States or for the United States, but um, the Palestinians have to start taking some responsibility for what's going on. Uh, and the question I have is, what have they done over the last 40 years to instill the confidence in the United States to maybe... Uh, ease up on the relationship or, or become more, as you say, even-handed. And what can, do you think they should be doing or can be doing to instill the, the, the uh, confidence that you, you two have that, they, that the United States should end that relationship? Thank you for the question. That's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, as someone who's, who's wrote a book recently about just this issue in Palestinian history about the responsibility that the Palestinians have to consider uh, uh, for things that have happened in Palestinian history, not just in the last couple of decades, but going back to the 20s and 30s. Uh, I think it's a question that should be asked by Palestinians and to Palestinians, and I, 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 uh, I take the point. Um, what, what can Palestinians do? Uh, firstly, they have to get their act together. It's absolutely essential that there be a Palestinian consensus on how to get out of the mess that they're in. And that's up to the Palestinians themselves. Nobody else can do that for them. And that's the first thing. Uh, uh, we're talking about Israel because that's the proposition before the House. You voted on something about the United States and the Israeli special relationship. But I think it's a good question anyway, because this is a key element uh, of this problem. The Palestinians, I have to say, have not just been systematically divided uh, by outside forces. They have failed to unify themselves. The Palestinians have not just failed uh, to generate some of the leadership that I think they deserve. I've been very critical of Palestinian leadership in the past. It is, however, the case that their leadership has been systematically subject to assassination, not just by Israel, also by Arab governments. And they have problems not only with Israel. They have severe problems with all of the Arab governments with which they have to deal, governments which, by and large, are not democratic, governments which, by and large, do not represent their own people. And that's another problem that we're not discussing here, but which I think is well worth Thank discussing. You. Um, I, I just want to ask, are there, are there no women with questions? <laughs> Thank you. I, I didn't see you before. Right in the center. We're going right to do three women in a row here now. Right in the center. Do you have a microphone? There's one over here, John. 
Okay, I'll, I'll come back. I'll, I will come to you. Can you can you bring the mic a little bit closer? It might not be turned on. Can it's you not hear me? On, it's not on yet. Try one more time. It's not your fault. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Rima Hijazi. I'm a master's in Near Eastern Studies at NYU. Um, the idea of morality has been mentioned by both sides. It's been mostly invoked by Mr. Eisenstadt, saying that we can't end this special relationship because it would be undermining the morality that is what the special relationship is. And I would like to ask you, Mr. Eisenstadt, why the principle of morality is not being applied to the case of the Palestinians. So when you discuss that just, uh, justice and fairness is important, what would justice and fairness look like in the West Bank and Gaza? What can Israel do for justice, for justice and fairness to exist there? And can you also speak about justice and fairness for Palestinians who live in Israel and have Israeli citizenship? I'm specifically are, thinking are, are of you, the... Are you asking what Israel can do or what the U.S. can do? Because I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to stay more towards... Our U.S. Topic. and Israel. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Fair enough. Stuart Eisenstein. I think it's a very good question. And it is a moral imperative of the United States not only to support Israel's independence and security, but also to see to it that the Palestinians have a decent standard of living and a state of their own. It is the United States of America that is the major economic supplier of aid to the Palestinians. Okay? Not France, not Germany, not the UK, not Russia. It is the United States. Number two, right now as we speak, General Dayton, a three-star general, is in the process of training over 20,000 Palestinian police who are in places like Janin, now able to take over security and allowing the Israeli Defense Forces to withdraw, allowing checkpoints to be reduced. I met in Davos 10 days ago, Prime Minister Fayyad. He's a great man. He is a great man. He is building a state from the bottom up. He told me, Stu, we're going to have 10% real growth in the territories in West Bank. And the reason is because the Palestinians are now under U.S. leadership, beginning to take on their own security, rooting out Hamas, and giving the Israeli Defense Forces the confidence to withdraw. So the United States is supporting economically, militarily, in every other way, the effort of the Palestinians to develop their state. And George Mitchell who negotiated after many, many hard years the Good Friday Agreement on Northern Ireland, is a superb negotiator. He is there every month negotiating as an honest broker with the notion that we have a responsibility to the Palestinians as well as to the Israelis. Ma'am, can I ask you? I want to, I want to come back to you um, because I saw how intently you were listening. Did, what did you think of that answer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll bring a mic. Let's, let's just let a mic come back to you. But I, I don't want it to go on terribly long. I just want to know if it went to what to the point that you were asking about. Um, I would like to, is it on? Yeah. Um, compare the aid that you just spoke of with the um, millions or billions of dollars that go towards um, Israel in terms of military aid, if not other aid okay, as well. Okay, the aid to the uh, Palestinians only started fairly recently because it is only after Madrid that the PLO abandoned their charter to destroy Israel, Hamas has yet to do it, and indicated a willingness to have a two-state solution, although they haven't fulfilled it. So the economic aid hasn't accumulated, but it is very substantial, uh, on a per capita basis very substantial, and it's all going for economic assistance. There was a, yes, ma'am, I see you at the far corner. And um, you have a yellow pad in your hand. And if you wave at a microphone, we'll come to you. There you are. Uh, my name is Sarah Lehman, and I write for the Jewish Press. 
And I have a statement and a question directed mostly towards Roger Cohn. Can you do more question than statement? Yes. Thank okay. You. In light of the fact that Israeli concessions over the years have not led to peace because the Palestinians have responded mostly with violence, and also in light of the fact that Hamas charter has not changed its call for the destruction of the Jewish state, and the incitement that continues to go on, uh, anti-Semitic incitement and propaganda by the Palestinians under the supposed uh, I need, moderate... I need to come home with this okay, question. I see on. where you're going. Uh, personally, as a Jew, how would you, uh, why would you advocate a severing of the special relationship with America in favor of towards Arabs or Palestinians who wish for your demise? That's a question for Roger Cohn, I'm assuming? Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyone? I think I've tried to dis describe why. Uh, certainly there have been uh, Israeli attempts, very serious Israeli attempts, to make peace. But if you look at the last 20 years, peace is going to involve an exchange of land. And what has Israel continued to do over the last 20 years? It has doubled, tripled the size of the settlements uh, in the West Bank. And this simply makes it impossible uh, to make that exchange. Look, the, what we just heard about what's happening in the West Bank shows that there's nothing congenital about uh, a Palestinian inability to take responsibility for their lives and for their governance. Uh, given half a chance, I think they are capable of it. But when, if you, have you driven through the West Bank recently, madam? What did you see? I think you saw a fractured, divided Palestinian community, Israeli garrisons on every hill, roadblocks, the difficulty of families to get to the market, to get to the fields, to get to their jobs, and so on. What does this say to Palestinians about the seriousness of Israeli intent to make peace. It says these guys are not serious. And why has it that the excellent Prime Minister Syed has not come back to the table? He's not come back to the table because the Palestinians are not satisfied of the essential seriousness of the Israelis. And what is enabling the government of Prime Minister Netanyahu to take this stance? It is the unconditional nature of U.S. support under the special relationship, yeah. which is why, ladies and gentlemen, you should vote for the proposition tonight. Yeah. We're, um, we're coming down towards the end of the question section, so I just want to ask the panelists at this point to be slightly more concise. Okay. Um, so uh, you know, get a few more questions. Yeah. Itamar Rabinovich. Uh, commenting on Roger Cohen's last, uh, last comment, I think in an earlier comment, you actually provided the answer as to why the Palestinians do not negotiate, because you painted a scenario that over the next 10, 20 years, if the status quo continues, there will be one country with a Palestinian majority. Now, this fact has not been lost on many Palestinians, and support for the two-state solution has dwindled among the Palestinians because many of them say, you know, let's sit back and wait, and it will be all ours, because there will be one man, one vote with a Palestinian majority. And that is a very serious danger. That, that's why there are also commonalities. There's even commonalities between Rashid Khalidi and I because... But Itam, if that yeah. danger exists, why is Israel not being more serious about a two-state solution, which is because, the only way to avoid a one-state outcome? Because the answer is because the party I voted for lost the last election. Well, there you go. <laughs> Rashid, Rashid, do you want to Thank come you. in? Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to say something. Um, I, I, Palestinians negotiate. I'm a Palestinian-American. I spent three years negotiating. You were dealing with the Syrians. I was dealing with... Uh, with the Israelis. Yes, <laughs> yes. With and Rubinstein. how difficult is with that? With Yakim Rubinstein, specifically. Um, and what we, were, what we were facing then was an American commitment under the first Bush administration to do something if the uh, 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 things were done that prejudged or uh, in some way prefigured an outcome. And we came to them and we said, wait a minute, the Israelis are closing off Jerusalem. The closure of Jerusalem was just starting in this period. And settlement is continuing. They're eating the pie we're supposed to be negotiating. And we got no response from the United States. This was in 1991, when for years and years and years, Palestinians were negotiating. Palestinians negotiating with Israel without any problem for that entire decade 
uh, and got absolutely nowhere. Now you may say the Oslo Accords. The Oslo Accords immiserated the Palestinians. Palestinian GDP decreased over that decade from 1990 to 2000. Pal the Palestinians who were able to move anywhere in the occupied territories, into Israel, to the Golan Heights uh, 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 in 1990 or 91, 92, were locked into uh, uh, whatever you want to call them, Bantustans, ghettos, whatever you want to call them, by the end of that period of the Oslo Accords. So uh, uh, this process of settlement uh, is not something which is just a minor issue. It is a central issue. Stuart. It is absolutely central. If you, if you expect the Palestinians to negotiate, this is something that should have been stopped 20 years ago, Stuart, not in 2000. You can be concise, Stuart. <laughs> Professor, I, you're a historian. I was in charge of the economic dimension of the peace process. I can tell you your figures are totally incorrect. Between 1997 and 2000, the territories grew at an average of 5%. Unemployment was down to 8% in the West Bank and 14% in Gaza. 100,000 Palestinians were coming into Israel every single day to work. It was 40% of the GDP of the territories, their remittances. 20,000 Arab Palestinian business people could drive in without any checkpoints. At the okay? end of that yes, period? Yes, yes, 1997. And then what happened? Yasser Arafat in 2000 brought the whole house of cards down on the process, refusing the offer and instigating the second intifada. So it's very important to understand cause and effect here. We were on a real process to peace. I personally went to Gaza. I saw the Gaza industrial estate with 30 companies from all over the world creating 1,200 jobs in Gaza. A second phase started. We had. Israelis visiting Ramallah over the weekend. We had 100,000 Palestinians coming into Israel every day to work. Stuart, I, 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 we see where you're going on that point, but I, I, we have just a little bit more time left. There's a woman on the balcony, and just give a minute for the camera to find you. Um. Founder. My name is Danielle Brown. I'm from the Argo, a student at the Argov Program of Leadership and Diplomacy, the Interdisciplinary Center Herzliya in Israel. We just arrived two days ago. Uh, my question is about U.S. public opinion, because as we saw in the last presidential debate, as in all presidential debates, the one thing that both candidates always agree on is the special relationship with Israel. And this is not a coincidence. This is because the, all studies and all polls show that the United States public supports this special relationship. Now, uh, so, so what's your question? So my question is, of course, to uh, Mr. Cohen and Professor Halliday, should... Isn't it a shame that this, uh, the, public, the public support of the, United, of the people, isn't it a shame to American democracy that this is not factored into this debate? Well, Roger Cohen. Thank you for that question. It makes uh, any adjustment in U.S. policy toward Israel, such as President Obama is now trying to accomplish, extremely difficult. There's a state called Florida. It's a vital state in the U.S. presidential election. It has a large Jewish community. This calculation is not lost on America's political leadership. President Obama, I understand, has been told by some uh, Jewish congressman, if you want your health bill, uh, step back on Israel. So uh, the reality is, um, yeah. indeed, that it is very hard. Yeah. I have heard that reliably. The, the reality of, of the situation is that it is uh, extremely difficult to steer U.S. public opinion in any way toward any acceptance of an adjustment uh, of policy toward uh, the state of Israel. I think it should be done in the following terms. The president should explain that the adjustments he is making are in pursuit of peace and in pursuit of the long-term peace and security of the state of Israel. Policies up to now have failed. Stuart. Therefore, we should see a change. Stuart Eisenstein. I was wondering how... I was wondering how long it would take and who would raise the issue of quote-unquote untoward Jewish influence over U.S. foreign policy. And Roger, you finally came to it. Now, let me just say, I've served in three administrations. I I've didn't say involved. untoward. This is, this is a dangerous, this is a dangerous <clears throat> canard that 2% of the 
of the U.S. population has somehow got its hand around the neck of American foreign policy. American foreign policy toward Israel is supported by a bipartisan majority because the American public recognizes that Israel and the United States share common interests and common values. And those are... Brief, brief, brief. And those are always counterbalanced by oil interests, by corporate interests that have major, by defense interests, major business interests. That's the way policy is made in the United States. It's the clash of interests. But the notion that 2% of the U.S. population is driving a policy against where the public thinks is simply belied by Itamar. every survey that's, that's been made. Nobody said that. That's a strong man, Stuart. Very, very, short, very short advice. Maybe you should elect a president from Alaska where there are no Jews. <laughs> All right, Witty. You would like that. There's a gentleman uh, with the blazer and sweater. This may be our last question. Can't see him because of the my name is Alan. My name is Alan Skolnick. Israel, as many of you know, has 1.2 million Arabs living in Israel. There are probably more mosques in Israel than, or certainly than there may be close to synagogues in Europe. With that background in mind, the presumption that we hear all, all during the discussion of the course of this debate is, is that uh, a Palestinian state, uh, if it was to be, uh, would have to be essentially without any Jews. Uh, the whole discussion is that settlements is the biggest impediment to peace. I'll throw something out of the box, Roger Cohn. Why does the Palestinian position, which I think might engender more US, a better U.S. special relationship, why is it built on a basis of inclusion, even, a minor, even at the scant chance of a minority of Jews, and establish itself on, on, on enforcing minority rights, for some, even for Jews, and demonstrate its moral character and its commitment to peace, instead of having to, to, to give us a, a constant reiteration of a new Arab country that will be one more without any Jews. Thank Dr. Cohen. Thank you, sir. I'm not sure there are many Israelis who would want to go and live uh, in the West Bank, uh, certainly under the current conditions. There are, there are some who live there. I'm not going to argue with you, sir, that uh, Israel is by far the most liberal and democratic uh, state in the region. It has, it, has, it has a free press. It has a relatively independent judiciary. Uh, it has a democratic system. It has remarkable achievements in technology and its economy. It has everything except peace. And what we're talking about tonight is how to steer, how best to steer this remarkable society toward what it's questing for. And I don't think it's through the policies Israel is currently pursuing or through the current backing that the United States is giving for those policies. That is what uh, we are debating. Would, it, would a Palestinian state, if it ever comes into being, uh, should it offer equality of opportunity for citizens of all race, religion, background, etc.? Yes, uh, it should. And that concludes round two of our debate. And here's where we are. We are about to hear brief closing statements from each of the debaters in turn. Those statements will be two minutes each, and it's their last chance to change your minds. And from the live audience beforehand, we knew where you stood before the debate actually began on our motion. The U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel. We asked you to vote before the debate where you stood, and at that point, 33% of you were for the motion, 42% were against, and 25% remain undecided. You will be asked to vote once again and pick the winner in just a few minutes from now. But first, we're going on to round three closing statements and speaking first against the motion. The U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel. Stuart Eisenstadt, former ambassador to the European Union under Bill Clinton and chief domestic policy advisor to Jimmy Carter. Number one, Israel is not a recruitment tool for terrorism, as Roger said. It is absolutely not. They recruit on the basis of hatred toward the West and toward secular pro-Western Arab states. Number two, Israel has shown when there is a peace partner, Sadat in Egypt, King Hussein in 
Jordan, that they will negotiate, that they will make uh, concessions, and peace will come when the Palestinian leadership demonstrates a commitment like Arafat, like uh, uh, Hussein did and uh, like Sadat did. Third, let's talk about concrete benefits. Israel does not just act on its own interests. It, for example, in the first Gulf War in 1991, agreed with President H George H.W. Bush not to retaliate against the barrage of Saddam Hussein's Scud missiles on Tel Aviv, staying in shelters so that President Bush could keep his coalition together in the first Gulf War. Second, Israel gives concrete benefits by supporting the U.S. in terms of anti-nuclear proliferation in the region, destroying the nuclear reactor of, of Saddam Hussein in Iraq in 1981, and more recently of Syria's budding nuclear facility supported by North Korea, and standing shoulder to shoulder with the U.S. on the Iranian uh, nuclear arms ambitions, and allowing the U.S. to take the lead on sanctions. Israel shares real-time intelligence. I've seen it with the U.S. on terrorism aimed at the U.S., not simply at itself, on Iran's nuclear capabilities. General Keegan, the former head of Air Force Intelligence, said, quote, I could not have obtained the same intelligence I received from Israel if there were five CIAs. Israel also has joint military exercise. Time is up, but I'll give you one more sentence to summarize. Thank you. In, in terms of the economy itself, which we haven't talked about, Israel serves as the location for every major American high-tech company developing cell phones and chips to keep America safe with passports, Stuart providing Thank aerial you very much. vehicles you. to help our borders. Thank you, Stuart Eisenstadt. Summarizing for the motion, the U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel, Roger Cohen, a columnist and former foreign correspondent and foreign editor for The New York Times. Ladies and gentlemen, if you strip away all the rhetoric of the opposing team, in the end, what are they arguing for? They are arguing for more of the same. If you think more of the same is fine, if you think the growing hatreds, antagonism, estrangement in the area is just fine, uh, then you should vote against the resolution and not for it, as we are arguing. I don't believe that's the case. I believe what's going on is unhealthy, and the United States by stepping back, would put pressure on Israel to adjust its policies and open new avenues to the new Middle East of which President Obama has spoken. In the end, you have to put your backbone where your wishbone is. And what does America wish for? Two states, Israel and Palestine, living side by side in peace and security. And as we've described, uncritical U.S. support of Israel in, pol in policies that undermine the possibility of two states is just a recipe for further failure. What does America also wish for under President Obama? It wants a new relationship with the Islamic world. This will require more than just words and pretty speeches. It will require a new balance in the U.S. approach to the region, a new readiness to speak to enemies. Only then will we move forward. And if you think as Stu Eisenstadt just suggested, that if the United States succeeded in establishing a new and more harmonious relationship with the Islamic world, that this would have no effect, no effect whatsoever on the terrorist threat that the United States faces. Uh, believe me, I think you are wrong. I'd like to conclude with the words of Mahmoud Darvish, the great Palestinian poet who died last year. And he wrote in his poem, State of Siege, me or him? That's how war starts, but it ends in an awkward stance, me and him. It's time for American policy to reflect better the him and the me of the Middle East. For all sorts of reasons, this will not be easy, which is why, ladies and gentlemen, you would help in this difficult adjustment by being courageous and voting for the proposition tonight. Thank you, Roger Cohen. We're on, a, we're on a little bit of a course of these two-minute statements turning into two minutes and 24 seconds, so I'm going to give that to everybody. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our motion is the U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel. And summarizing his position against the motion, Itamar Rabinovich, former Israeli ambassador to the United States and chief negotiator with Syria in the mid-1990s. I want to look at the vision, at the dream. The President of the United States on Air Force One landing at an airport in Gaza. Wouldn't that be a great moment? It already happened. Bill Clinton landed with Air Force One at an Air Force in Gaza in the late 1990s. There was an effort by our opponents to describe a unilinear uh, Israeli undermining uh, of any effort to make peace between Israel and Palestinians to the detriment of the region of the United States. But actually, during the last 20 years and 30 years, almost 40 years of a peace process that began in 1973, what kept the peace process going was American-Israeli cooperation. There were some very high moments in this, the peace with Egypt, peace with Jordan, <clears throat> first Israeli visits to countries in the Gulf and in North Africa, and yes, Clinton's landing in the Gaza Strip at an airport when it seemed that the Palestinians were on their way to statehood and independence before everything turned sour because of a change of mind of Yasser Arafat's conduct that led to the disastrous consequences of the last decade, 2000 to 2010. Second, I think we had a problem. Our debate was uh, diverted uh, tonight from a debate on the U.S.-Israeli special relationship to a debate on the Palestinian problem, a very worthy subject, but not exactly at the focus of the issue. The issue is, here is the Middle East, a crucial part of the world. Here is an Arab world, 330 million people, almost uh, half, a mi uh, half a billion in a decade or two. This is not all subjected to the Palestinian issue. There are many other issues. Iran was barely mentioned tonight. Now I dare you. You go to somebody who lives in Kuwait, to somebody who lives in Cairo, or somebody who lives in Amman, and ask him, what is uppermost in your mind? And he would say, Iran, the Iranian threat, the Iranian bomb, the Iranian expansionism. And what do you expect? I expect the United States to protect me from Iran. And yes, the, Ira Iran, the United States can do that, thank, and thank it can you, do it Mar with Rabinovich. Israel. Thank you, Thank you. Our motion is the U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel. Our final speaker to summarize his position for the motion, Rashid Khalidi, professor at Columbia University and former advisor to the Palestinian delegation for Arab-Israeli peace negotiations. Thank you. You should vote for this proposition because it would end our record of failure in Palestinian-Israeli peacemaking. And counter to the views of, that you've just heard, this is centrally important in the Middle East. You should vote for this proposition because it would stop the United States from enabling Israel in its worst habits of occupation and settlement, things that harm the United States, harm, of course, the Palestinians, but also harm Israel. Most importantly, you should vote for the proposition because it would help to bring peace and would be in the U.S. national interest. I've said that if you do not vote for this proposition, you are voting for the status quo. More process, no peace. Now, that is not a status quo that is stable. That is a status quo that is evolving, I would suggest, in a fashion not favorable to, I think, most of the interests that most of us share. Let me read a quote briefly. As long as in this territory, west of the Jordan, there is only one political entity called Israel, it is going to be either non-Jewish or non-democratic. The speaker continued, if this block of millions of Palestinians cannot vote, that will be an apartheid state. This was not some anti-Semite. This was not some Israel basher. This was the defense minister of the state of Israel, Ehud Barak, speaking on the 3rd of February in Herzliya. That is the status quo. That is where it is going. It is in, ultimately, a decision for the Israelis to take where they want to go. But we enable this. That is why you should vote for this proposition. And let me conclude by saying something about Iran. If Israel attacks Iran, in a situation where this special relation is unmodified, imagine, if you will, the impact on U.S. interests, on U.S. troops in Iraq, on U the U.S. position in the Gulf, on the Gulf itself, 
uh, if this relationship remains unchanged, if the United States is perceived as the handmaiden, the guardian, the enabler of everything that Israel does, we will be responsible when and if that catastrophic thing happens. I I Iran is a problem for the region, not just for Israel, but it is not a problem to be resolved in the way that a lot of Israelis are pushing us to resolve it. That is why, among many other reasons, you should vote for the proposition. Thank you, Rashid Khalidi. And that concludes our closing statements. And now it's time to learn which side you feel argued best. We're going to ask you again to go to the keypads at your seat. Our motion is the U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel. If you agree with the motion now, push number one. If you disagree, push number two. If you remain undecided, push number three. Or if you became undecided, push number three. And if you... I hear somebody having some trouble. If you push the wrong button, just push it, the one you want to correct with, and it will lock in. All right, so we are um, very close to getting the results, which I think we're locking out and are being tabulated at the moment. So um, before I get to those, first of all, I want to, uh, I want to thank our panelists for coming here uh, in the spirit of, of listening as well as debating. I also, uh, I also want to thank the people in the audience who asked questions because there, there wasn't a clunker among them. Uh, thank you, all of you, for, for your questions as well. I'm not sure about that. Okay, you're not sure about it. <laughs> I thought they were pretty good. Um, some future announcements. Our next debate will be Tuesday, March 16th. The motion then is don't blame teacher unions for our failing schools. Panelists for the motion are Kate McLaughlin, a math teacher from Lowell, Massachusetts, Gary Smuts, who is superintendent of the ABC Unified School District in California, and Randy Weingarten, who is president of the American Federation of Teachers. Against the motion, Terry Moe, professor of political science at Stanford, Rod Page, a former U.S. Secretary of Education, and Larry Sand, a former teacher and president of the California Teachers Empowerment Network. Intelligence Squared U.S. is going to announce a change in our topic for the May 11th debate. The new motion for that debate uh, on that evening is going to be this. Obama's foreign policy is a gift to America's enemies. With the Obama presidency now entering its second year, the administration's foreign policy taking shape uh, and the voices of many political opponents and even some supporters beginning to challenge his decisions, we felt the time was right for a thoughtful debate on this topic. And the actual debaters are uh, being booked now, and we will announce who they are soon. You can still get individual tickets by visiting our website and at the Skirball box office. Make sure to become a fan of Intelligence Squared U.S. on Facebook, and you can thereby receive a discount on upcoming debates. All of our debates, as you know, can be heard on more than 200 NPR stations across the nation, and you can watch our spring debates on Bloomberg Television Network. Air dates and times can be found in your program tonight. And don't forget to read about tonight's debate in the next edition of Newsweek, and you can pick up the current issue on your way out. Okay, now it's all in. We have the final results. Remember, the team that changes the most minds is declared our winner. And here it is. Before the, oh, I have an empty page. Oh, I picked up the old one. <laughs> Nothing happened. Before the debate, 33% of you were for the motion, 42% of you were against the motion, 25% were undecided. The U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel after the debate. 49% agree with the motion, 47% are against, 4% undecided. The side for the motion are our winners. Congratulations to them. Thanks, thanks to all of you, from me, John Donvan, and Intelligence Squared U.S. Congratulations. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Thanks, Eden. Thanks, Eden.